Most of us are probably familiar with what Undertale is. This strange, quirky, meta-narrative driven retro-style RPG influenced by the likes of Earthbound that hinges around the choices of how bloodthirsty you decide to be over the course of the game. Pacifist, neutral, or no mercy. Choices which affect subsequent playthroughs. It's probably one of the biggest understatements I could make to say that it's pretty popular. It spawned thousands of pieces of fan art, cosplays, fan games, alternate universe concepts, animations based around theories about specific obscure characters that will only turn up if you have specific integers in your save file. And even the wrestler Kenny Omega dressed as one of its characters on an episode of AEW Dynamite. One of the aspects of Undertale that has massively grabbed the fandom is the music. If you ever wanted to spend thousands of hours travelling down the rabbit hole of something, look no further than the music related to Undertale. There's once again hundreds, possibly thousands, of covers in various genres. Fan-made original pieces, mashups, versions of the original song set to lyrics, and of course, hundreds of different iterations of character themes based around the assorted alternate universes that the fans have come up with. Now here's the thing. I'm not actually a fan of the game itself. Call it overhype, call it frustration with the mechanics, part of it is admittedly an objection to the messages that Toby Fox is presenting, but it just didn't grab me in the way it grabbed others. However, something that has grabbed me is the alternate universe concepts people have come up with, along with the variations on character themes that people have created to accompany those alternate universes. As such, I would like to do a deep delve into what is probably the most storied and popular of the themes from the game, Megalovania. Naturally, I won't be doing this all in one episode, otherwise the video would be 20 hours long, so this is going to be a bit of a series. First, we'll have a look at the Toby Fox version, going over its history and how it evolved, along with its influences and how they all worked within their original context. Next, we'll look into some of the more popular versions that have been modified to affect a particular mood, style and theme. And as we progress, we'll look into some of the weirder versions and mashups of universes and the like. SpongeBob Undertale is a thing, so make of that what you will. Now it's important to note that as the series progresses, things will become a bit trickier owing to how certain AUs have all but been erased, save for a few scant fragments. As such, I will try my best to look into increasingly obscure examples and provide what analysis I can, but I by no means can guarantee anything. So without further ado, let's get on to the first of Toby Fox's versions. The original version of Megalovania was used for Radiation's Halloween Hack, a hack Toby Fox made of the JRPG Earthbound, which by and large went on to inform Undertale as a whole. As a consequence of, according to the wiki, Toby Fox never getting around to making use of the Live A Live track, Megalomania as the final boss theme, Fox just yelled whatever he felt like into a microphone and copied it down. Inspiration was apparently drawn from Megalomania and, for the sake of giving it a feeling reminiscent of Halloween, he mashed the title up with Transylvania. 
In its original incarnation, Megalovania was used for a fight against an NPC who in the standard game assists the player to face off against the big bad of Earthbound known as Gigas. There's time travel involved and it's very up in the air as to whether or not you'll be able to come back at all. The context here is that the player, instead of changing the past, created an alternate timeline which they went to, whilst Dr. Adenaut, the aforementioned NPC, was left to believe his friends had died horribly. As a consequence, the good doctor's mind was broken and he ultimately becomes a far greater foe than even Gigas was. Which is saying something because Gigas is some form of bizarre eldritch abomination that himself has spawned multiple fan theories around. Clearly, this has greatly informed on Toby Fox's writing style considering how many fan theories abound about Undertale. Hell, despite my misgivings, I have a couple of my own. When Megalovania is used in the Dr. Adonarts fight, it was a standard boss fight theme. Nothing much to read into it past how it's sympathetic to the situation presented. It has this weird, unnerving wind-in that makes you feel rather uncomfortable, intentionally so, and builds into a quick, frenetic pace that really helps to emphasise the feeling of battling for your life against someone in an entirely different league to you. This version is deliberately strange. The unsettling tones in the opening lend it a much more alien effect, and overall it has a far weirder feel as a consequence of being entirely comprised of synths and keyboards, which helps to emphasise the menace of the character of Dr. Andernauts. And because there is a cogent, explicable pattern to the music, it greatly helps to reinforce the concept that although the mind is warped and broken, there is still a method to the madness. One thing to note that helps to inform upon the emotions Fox is trying to affect, which I'll quickly come back to when we get to the Undertale version, is that the original was recorded in the key of A and uses a minor blues scale, thus emphasising the tragedy and chaos of Dr. Andernaut's experiences. So that's the original version, or at least the earliest example we have readily available. Now let's look into the Homestuck version. So this is going to require a bit of context. I'll be honest, most of my knowledge is by osmosis, having talked to friends about it and watched relevant videos about Homestuck. Most of my personal experience has been playing through the first few pages of Homestuck, watching the relevant video and a couple of others, playing an RP that a friend of mine ran a while back, and playing through some of Hiveswap, the sort of side story point and click adventure game based on Homestuck. So anyway, if you're unfamiliar, Homestuck is a webcomic that focused around many different characters' experiences with a game called Spurb. Turns out that this is kinda like the plot of Jumanji 2, where the game is another universe, they go inside to escape the destruction of their own world. Roll on to when Megalovania gets used. The sequence in question focuses around members of a race of strange grey-skinned aliens called Trolls. A couple of friends have provided me with much needed context that wouldn't require dedicating cumulative weeks of my life pouring through it to understand, and one of them has graciously contributed an excellent summary of matters. So without further ado, take it away, Gad. <laughs> Do excuse me. Now, to explain what happens here, you must understand two rules of the game of Spurb. Firstly, every player, in this instance the troll children, have another body that they wake in whenever they are asleep. These are their dream selves, and depending on the child they dwell on the moon of Prospect or Durse. Secondly, for the duration of the game, the players progressively level up and up until at the end, 
they achieve their first god tier. To officially do so, the player must die while resting upon their own quest bet. Not to worry kids, they do come back. Now, in this animation, the divinely empowered villain Bec Noir kills two of the trolls before destroying Durse entirely. On Durse was the dream self of the troll Aradia. She was dead beforehand, with her ghost inhabiting a robot, and Spurb's game mechanics could only cope with this by keeping her dream self asleep. At the time Durse and everyone on it was destroyed, the dream self was resting upon the quest bed. The dream self dies, Aradia's robot body explodes, and she awakens as a goddess of time, easily capable of stopping Bec Noir in his tracks. Later that day, we find Vriska, the fascinatingly terrible person who learned how to achieve god tier before anyone else being confronted by her so-called friend Tavarus. She's committed many terrible deeds up to now, murder, treachery, lying, and crippling Tavarus for life before he got new robot legs. So now the boy intends to stop her once and for all. Unfortunately, poor Tavarus never stood a chance. Oh. Ah well, back to you, Edmund. So with this version, we've taken the original style and beefed it up with some guitars, smoothed it out a bit and upped the tempo slightly. Along with this, we have an inversion of the original, taking it from being a villain's song to it working as a hero's rise to action, becoming the unstoppable force to defeat the immovable object. Meanwhile, we contrast that with the second half of the video, where it still functions as the hero's song, but instead of a triumphant victory over an in implacable force, it is a tragic defeat of an already maimed hero. And from there, things get very interesting where the Undertale rendition is concerned. So finally, we get to the big one, the one that made this song popular. So here's the context for the Undertale version, for those who aren't aware. If you decide to just treat the game like your typical RPG, where you kill all the encounters and defeat all the bosses and gain as much experience as possible, then when it nears the end, you'll encounter Sans. Sans up until this point has been this sweet, charming goofball who loves to make jokes and just wants what's best for his brother. Which is why if you decide to go down the No Mercy route, he turns into one of the toughest bosses in modern gaming history, and the fight is punctuated with the use of megalovania. The song is not simply a theme, but it is designed to affect a message and concept. There's another evolution and inversion of the piece going on here. Instead of it being the piece of the main character like it would be in Homestuck, where by and large you're semi-playing the comic, you have become the implacable force that the hero is rising up to defeat, and it is all with the catalyst of an otherwise unimportant, unassuming individual, Sans's brother. A key aspect that's interesting to consider is how it utilises a lay motif that runs through a lot of the music in Undertale, particularly in the villages, normally used to evoke a certain level of serene, almost dreamlike nature, and then radically becoming horrific and nightmarish within the fight. <laughs> It's almost like it's invoking the wrath of the very people you've been killing and how much Sans is fighting for them. For as many gripes as I might have with the game, 
Toby Fox is a genius when it comes to juxtaposing and playing with your expectations musically. It's become slightly faster again. The electronic and actual instruments are being meshed together more cohesively, all to evoke this feeling of utter fury and absolute desperation on the part of Sands. It really helps to impress the idea that if he fails, all is lost, not just for the monster world, but for the human world as well. And this is where we come to a further evolution, as it affects this idea of having taken the Homestuck context and combined the two halves' perspectives, thus meaning that as the fight itself progresses, who the song applies to changes. What emphasises this effect is that Sans himself is almost a reflection of Tavros, with you being a reflection of Vriska. Sans is determined to defeat you, and in theory has the power to do so, but ultimately all that's keeping him alive is dodging, as he has but one solitary hit point, jokingly being called the easiest enemy by his info box because of it. All that's actually being done in this encounter is your wearing down a narrative health bar, exhausting Sans until he can no longer dodge and you can finally end the fight. And all this punctuated by a song that had originally started life as just a piece for a fan project itself, sped up, pitch shifted and tuned to D. So from its humble beginnings as this puzzling little song for an old Nintendo hack, Megalovania gradually evolved and developed dramatically under the steam of just one man. One man with an insanely effective vision of just how elaborately his own piece of music could be utilised and how much nuance you can find in just the slightest of modifications. So if one man can manage all that, what does that mean when you have an entire fan base filled with incredibly imaginative, creative and talented people? Join me next time as we begin our deep delve into the countless AUs that exist, starting with three of the most popular examples and investigate how instrumentation, sound and tone can be modified to affect just the right themes.